there. Welcome to this episode of the Skip Meetings Podcast, the podcast for curious event professionals embracing the future of business events. My name is Miguel Neves, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skiff Meetings, and in this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Lance Trebesh, the CEO of Event Groove, and our topic of interest today is true partnership. We cover a lot of ground, including the palpable energy of events. We talk about the foundational layer of great events, the things that need to happen, and also the creative layer, which is what makes great events truly memorable. We talk about clear and fair pricing, something that Lance really believes in, and it forms the basis of what Lance calls a true partnership. We talk about how Lance and his team love to help organizations start to run events digitally. And we talked about how Lance thinks that we've crossed the Rubicon on remote work, but that events are magical in the way that they bring people together, and he doesn't see that changing anytime soon. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation, and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Skip Meetings podcast. You can find them on our website or by subscribing through your favorite podcast service. And now for a word from our sponsors, PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. Today, I am delighted to have Lance Trebish here, CEO of Event Groove. Lance, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Miguel. I'm uh, looking forward to it. So Lance, we met only recently, I think at IMAX America, a common acquaintance introduced us and I learned about uh, your company, Event Groove, which I have to admit I was not familiar with. So I'd love to start there and, but you know, take us through your kind of journey and what I usually ask our guests and hopefully you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll also have an interesting insight into that is, is the moment where you kind of understood or figured out the, the events industry. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, I'll give a little bit of background on the company and then, you know, and then answer that. So the company was founded in uh, 97. So we call ourselves a 25 year old startup or 20, 26 now uh, by my fellow uh, co-owner and, and the founder of the company, Mike Yinger. So Mike was uh, a top IBM global software architect, always on the road. And uh, his friend who ran the local community playhouse uh, asked him over beers, Mike, printing tickets is really difficult <clears throat> in terms of the variable data, the serial numbers, et cetera. Can you make software to make it less difficult? So the entrepreneurial light went off uh, for Mike to get off the road. He uh, created uh, a desktop downloadable ticket printing software. Uh, people loved it. They asked him to start uh, stubbing paper, which he did in his garage, anything to get off the road. And then finally, people said, Mike, you know, just do it all for me. And so that became um, really what, you know, event groove, you know, print on demand is what we call that. And these are any product, any event product that you need to, you know, do all your offline marketing for an event like postcard mailers. But then all of the products you need at the event, signage, banners, wristbands, et cetera. Yeah. And that used to be called uh, ticketprinting.com. Is that the original? That was the original brand. Yeah. And a very literal Google, you know, specific <laughs> brand domain. I came on board in 2007 as CEO and co-owner. Mike wanted to get back to programming. And uh, we built out that part of the platform uh to uh to, to a full e-commerce platform so the way to look at that is we're you know look at us as kind of shopify plus etsy for event exclusively focused on event products and merchandise mm -hmm. so we enable event management companies marketing companies you know event customers to set up their own e-commerce storefronts to design products to go in those storefronts 
And then, of course, to sell those products or to use them as, uh, you know, kind of their internal corporate ordering uh, sites. Okay. Um, and I'm getting to your answer. Uh, but then uh, we launched in 2014 uh, Event Groove Events. And Event Groove Events, because we had so many different customers, uh, probably, you know, 45,000 per year across every type of segment from nonprofits to entertainment to corporate, et cetera, um, we came out with a general offering that would kind of be general offering, self-serve, set up your event online, sell tickets online. Um, as we started talking to our uh, larger customers who run complex you know, events programs, with the light bulb that came off for me in terms of really understanding you know, events and understanding how large organizations and companies put on events, it happened in that moment because what they needed was scale. And what they needed was standardization, you know, across their distributed enterprise and, and company. And so that's the moment where I think in those conversations with our customers, I truly, in an almost visceral way, grasped, you know, the events industry. But you had experience with the events industry before that? I did not. So before that, uh, this is my fourth startup I've been part of. So I, I was part of early teams of three uh, tech startups in the Bay Area. Okay. And did you use events in those tech startups and the growth process and the field market, anything like that? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, it was very much in the days of, <clears throat> um, you know, going to CES, for example, and setting up, you know, field market, classic field marketing, setting up a booth, doing a big PR launch, uh, either A, the company, or B, your next version of your software. So it was very much what I would, you know, in those days, call kind of standard field marketing uh, and very conference uh, reliant. Okay, interesting. So yeah, just to go back to Event Groove, so it's quite an interesting product. I mean, I've only learned about it recently, but you have the, the event side, so you have that kind of registration and kind of management side. You have the fundraising, and then you have this e-commerce. And and I want, want you to make, want make sure you explain the difference between those two, because I think the e-commerce side is really interesting in the way that you have all these, what I would call promotional products, right? And or kind of printing options and flyers and that kind of thing. And you make it very easy, very sort of hands, you know, kind of DIY, you, you upload a logo and you can go and print all these different things and make all these products. And what about the fundraising? What's specific about fundraising? Is, is that sort of awards gala kind of focused? What, what is that exactly? Yeah, so the fundraising platform uh, <clears throat> is online fundraising, but usually in conjunction with, you know, in-person events. So we have we have five different fundraiser types. Number one are auctions. Number two are raffles, uh, sweepstakes, crowdfunding, <clears throat> donation pages, and then one kind of horizontal, if you will, that goes across those is uh, peer to peer fundraising, which means you know peer to peer, of course, means you know competitive team fundraising. Hey, let's let's put a team together and let's see who can you know sell the most raffles. Uh, ticket. So where where we uh, market that is, of course, number one is our nonprofit segment um, <clears throat> because they're doing that all the time, and it really gives them both, you know, because we can do it purely online or in conjunction with events. It really digitizes in many ways <clears throat> their uh, previous processes of fundraising. Okay. Number two is we're also getting traction around corporate social responsibility you know, divisions within companies who want to raise money for good causes and sometimes want to put those uh, together in conjunction with an event. And so that gives them the, uh, you know, the online ability to, to raise that money and do it in a, you know, a fun way. Yeah, interesting. So it's a very different approach to, I think, most of the technology companies that we normally cover. So I think it's, it's quite interesting to understand that. I want to go back to sort of your journey and your career a little bit. And I want to see, um, obviously, I think it, this is always a fun question that I, that I ask some of our guests, which is, how do you explain to your family and friends what you do, people that are outside the industry? Yeah, great question. So, uh, and, and uh, you know, I live 
in Montana and, and my extended family are ranchers. And so, and ranchers are very technical, they use software, et cetera, but they have, you know, no idea what I do. And the way I explain it is, <clears throat> you know, I'm co-owner, I'm CEO of this company, title's not important, but what I sometimes use as a, a metaphor, really, <clears throat> it's not even a metaphor, it's just an actual thing, <clears throat> is I'll say I'm the chief energizing officer of the company. And <clears throat> in my view, uh, you know, is a person in my position needs to enter, you know, everything is accomplished in teams. I don't accomplish things on my own. No one in our company accomplishes things completely on their own. So my job is to energize, you know, my teams around vision and direction, <clears throat> help them with prioritization, uh, get the resources, you know, in some respects, the energy uh, for them to accomplish their goals and also build a culture that's an energizing, you know, culture that's positive and that uh, is always focused on growth. And then most of all, you know, is focused on really, you know, delighting our customers. So that's the way, uh, you know, that kind of that, that theme of energizing, that's the way I describe it uh, to, uh, you know, friends and family. And that sort of being involved in the events industry, does that make that unique in your mind? Or do you think that all those things would, would apply, you know, if you were working software for, for any other industry? I think all, all of those things apply for <clears throat> any, you know, software startup and company. I think with you know, the events industry specifically, um, I'll give you a customer example. So one of our customers is the Western Conservation Expo. They do, uh, it's a expo in Salt Lake every February, 42,000 people. Uh, three nights of pretty complicated banquets, uh, galas, <clears throat> all sorts of events and tracks along with it, 700 exhibitors. Um, the, what I would, when I describe that, of course, to friends and family, there is an energy kind of component to that. And, and that's where, where, frankly, you know, I get a lot of energy is when I actually attend my customer events and I see, you know, just the palpable energy. People love to be together. They love to be going to things they're passionate about. And uh, that definitely fits into kind of this, you know, energizing theme, if you will. Great. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So I want to talk a little bit about events and, and the way you look at events and what in your mind are the kind of key ingredients to make events really work? Uh, now, you know, I'm sure I'm sure they would involve your, your tools and your software, but I think from a, from a planner perspective, what do you think are the things that really make events stand out and become really memorable for, for those participating? Yeah, I, I look at this as, <clears throat> in my experience, there's really kind of you know, two layers to fantastic events. There's a foundational layer <clears throat> that uh, goes around goals, you know, and, it, you know, it's kind of a tired framework, but it nonetheless it works around goals, people, technology, and processes. And that foundational layer is, uh, the goals part of that, of course, is for the whole event. But it really, if you don't have goals, you really just don't have a foundation of what you were trying to achieve. <clears throat> Number two is, of course, with people, you know, it's an interesting, at least from what I've observed and been a part of, it's an interesting mix, diverse mix of generalists and specialists. And it's also a diverse mix of temperaments, you know, from the de de detail oriented person who's so invaluable to the, you know, visionary kind of broad strokes person who really kind of takes the, the you know, the, 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 the strategic themes of that event to a different level. Um, and then, yeah, you know, with a lot of events, of course, it's really not, uh, it's just good process and good process execution, which is, you know, sounds boring, but boy, if you don't do it, it really causes a lot of pain. 
And then the final part of that, you know, those four cornerstones of the that foundational layer, you know, is the technology. And <clears throat> does the technology enable you to scale? Does it uh, give, you know, a, a, you know, a great attendee experience? Um, does it, uh, and then of course, is it cost effective, right? Um, now I've talked about the foundational layer. On top of that though, is what I call the creative layer. And the creative layer is bespoke. I mean, and it, it's it, it's really kind of this broad palette of how do you how do you create a unique event? And even if it's the same event every year, how are you differentiating the event? Um, <clears throat> and what are the what are the variety of things, experiments even that you can add in that creative layer to make it memorable? And, you know, so many events are annual. And I think the ones that are most memorable are the ones that have, you know, really focus on that creative uh, layer and, and not trying to do the exact same things. The exact the same things, of course, happen uh, because, you know, there might be, you know, uh, a dinner, right? As part of the, uh, the, uh, the event, there might be a conference. But I think that creative layer is really important to kind of marry to the foundational layer. I like that. That's a very um, clear separation there. And I think it kind of, like you said, having the right people in the right roles makes a big difference there. So I know that um, we spoke recently about this kind of idea of saturation on digital channels, right? Um, I think digital, online, you said you talked about online auctions and fundraising. Um, I think it just seems to be the go-to place where people do business. But I think you said you were seeing uh, a saturation there and a turn towards events and other things as well. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'll, I'll um, so prior, I'll, I'll use a couple of the customer examples. So one of our <clears throat> largest customers is one of the largest national nonprofits in the country. They run uh, over 6,000 events on our platform. And uh, they're very much kind of an in-person, uh, in-person, uh, you know, organization. Of course, COVID hit, and you know, we we immediately on the platform enabled virtual uh, virtual events. We they they really uh, really uh, they really started using the online fundraising platform, and so all of that helped them really uh, you know survive. And even in some respects, kind of catalyze, you know, more of this kind of what you would call digitization of their of their you know, of their company and their and their processes, their core processes and operations. But um, you know, the the saturation we all feel it. This is nothing original here. Saturation of looking at screens uh, really uh, cannot ever be a substitute for the in person experience. Uh, and the in-person experience is not only the community building of, let's say, your uh, association, your members, if you're a nonprofit, kind of your donors and your passionate followers, but it's also with, of course, with corporations, uh, you know, and with customer retention, customer, you know, customer, uh, you know, relations, as well as driving new customer acquisition through lead gen. And so, what what we are seeing, at least within our platform is a fundamental return to in-person events. In-person events that are leveraging technology, but not overly relying on it. Um, the, the, mo the moment of magic, of course, is the event itself. Yep, that's what uh, I think a lot of listeners will be focused on is that moment of magic. And I think it's the, it's, yeah, it's that moment that matters in many ways, right? We can do a lot of the things online, uh, but then when we come together in person, when we gather, I think it, it is that that moment that does matter. So um, I think we've understood a little bit about Event Groove, which I think is an interesting structure. One thing that stands out for, from, from what I see on your site and from the things that I've read is this idea of true partner pricing. Uh, and... Um, I think a lot of companies in the industry, and I won't name any, but do try to have very rigid contracts in place, very long-term contracts. And kind of the pricing of event technology has been 
challenging for many planners over the years. Um, you've gone for a very transparent and from what I can tell, a very um, direct approach of uh, people. You charge people when they're making money, when they're getting registrations and you keep the, um, the contracts very short and kind of directly aligned to the events. Explain a little bit about how it works first, but then I want to talk a little bit about the thinking behind it and, and why you think it works. So I mean, why it works in terms of the, the technical side of, you know, what you do, but then why you think it sure. works, the psychology behind it. Yeah, well, I would, uh, if you don't mind, Miguel, I'll start with the thinking behind it. So as you may recall, when Salesforce launched, they had the red circle slash that said software in the middle. Because basically in the world of, you know, on-premise software, on-premise licensing, Salesforce really pioneered, you know, the software cloud. So if you think of that, you know, our circle slash, if you will, around event platforms is, you know, in that circle of the red with the slash would be business as usual. And, you know, we're really passionate about this, uh, you know, but being transparent, being upfront, and really being completely aligned with our customers and partners. And we do it in the following way. Number one, as you mentioned, we have a service fee model, 2% of the registration or ticket value plus 50 cents capped at $9.90. So what we like about that is that we only make money when our customers are making money. F events can be seasonal, they can be episodic, and we don't believe we deserve money if we're not, you know, executing an event uh, for, you know, helping our customers execute the event on the uh, platform. Um, so that's really, really important. Secondly is, uh, you know, there's, you know, in current kind of con event platform contracts, there's all sorts of uh, add-ons. There's all sorts of uh, things to watch out for. So in so in our you know in our you know ethos number one is uh, there are it's free use of the platform so ninety nine percent of our customers you know have the attendee pay that service fee they have free use of the platform there are no setup upfront uh, charges ever there are no ongoing uh, charges as in subscription charges we do not have anything uh, you know, in terms of quote unquote advanced feature pricing, like, hey, get Event Groove Pro, pay more. Everyone from the smallest event organizer to you know, the largest company doing thousands of events has full access to the entire platform. We also do free CRM integration uh, because that's extremely important. That's why you're having the event, right? <laughs> And so that's the second part of it. The third part of it is in terms of our contracts, we don't even require a contract. Some customers want a contract, but within those contracts, we uh, we have a clause for them that, that they can terminate for convenience. What that does for me and our company, that creates a value and an organizing principle within our company that we have to earn our, our customer's business every single day. We have to earn it. We have to be good every day, really good. And that that's really important um, for us. The last one, which at IMEX America, I really, really got a lot of positive feedback on, is that we uh, enable a full private label, uh, you know, event site for all of our customers on which they can run thousands of events. They can run one event. It doesn't matter. So what they like about it is it's their brand, you know, front and center, in the middle, wherever you want. It's, it's their brand through and through. And if you're running, you know, uh, events programs, and there are a, a, there are a wide variety of, uh, you know, of types of events. So let's say you have internal meetings, you, you know, sales incentive, et cetera. And then let's say you have external customer meetings. You may have one big conference. What that enables uh, that customer to do is run all of their events on their site, what we call their site, which is full private label. And so what where we are, you know, focusing and where we're evolving is 
one event platform that really does it all for that type of customer, uh, which is what we call enterprise event management for distributed event operations. Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. And so I think it's safe to say your, your customers tend to be in the nonprofit sector and then have multiple events, multiple chapters, different kind of activities going on in different parts of the world or different parts of the country. Well, yeah, our segments are nonprofits. Uh, you know, then the next segment is corporate, sports and rec, education, uh, as well as uh, as well as. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 entertainment. And so most people, what we have found at least is, uh, and we'll, we're fine with this, a one-off event. Uh, that's okay. Go to, a, you know, go to event group events, set it up and do it. Um, but what we find is generally, whether you're an event planner, whether you're, you know, a company, you know, events uh, manager, you're having a lot of different events. So rather than silo your events across one or two or three platform, I mean, excuse me, two or three or more platforms. What we're, what we pitch is put them all on our, on your site. It really becomes your site. You own the data. We'll integrate it to your CRM. And then you can really scale all types of events. And the great thing about it, of course, you're not paying for it every month. You're not running events. You know, you're not paying for anything. And then, of course, all that setup of that uh, viewer customer site, all the configuration, all of that is for free. Yeah, and I'd imagine if you've done the promotional product side with the logos, if the logo is still the same, you can reuse all that. That that sort of you can use that across That's right. events. Yeah. In addition, so, just you know, free events are free. We don't make money on our customers' free events without any limit of size. Without any limit of size. Okay. So that's different to the event uh, strategy, which is now limiting at twenty five, I believe. Um, so, want to go back to the to the, the pricing model? Um, I mean, you must have people try to convince you to have contracts and change that, and and kind of convince you that you're leaving money on the table, right? <laughs> yeah. So my 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 guiding light on this really is uh, uh, the company Costco. And you're probably familiar with Costco. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, Jim Senegal is the founder of the company, C you know, CEO now retired. Uh, he was uh, asked in almost every analyst meeting uh, to, why don't you, on Wall Street, of course, why don't you raise your prices? Because, of course, Costco only has a 14% markup. And he said, if we raise our prices, that breaks my trust with my customers and I'll never do it. <laughs> and and there were, and in those conversations from what I have heard, I mean, this is all public knowledge, right? Uh, they were asking for like a two, two, you know, once you raise it two points, like 16%. Mm -hmm. And he gets to said, no, we'll never do it. It's never gonna happen. And, um, you know, that's just, you know, the way we're building this. We, we want to build something different. We don't want to do business as usual. We think, you know, life is hard enough and events are hard enough that why spend, you know, a month to two months negotiating, a, you know, a lock-in long-term contract. Uh, we want to get our customers going. And, uh, and uh, you know, that energizes us. And also, frankly, you know, the benefit for us is, our sales cycles are, you know, are much, uh, are compressed, meaning they're quicker because either a customer, you know, wants to go with us or not, but the whole negotiation, contracting, all of that crap, we just don't need to do. They know exactly what they're going to get. And it's a lot. Yeah. Really interesting. And do you find that you, I don't know if you have any figures to compare with other companies, but you find that you're sort of 
you know the amount of time that a average customer stays with you is um is longer because of these kind of policies yeah we have i mean we have high customer retention and so um in general you know once uh, you know on the e-commerce side once a customer gets to, to uh, three uh, two purchases they stay with us for years on the event side once what we have found once we get a customer set up on their own site uh, and they become not only operationally invested in that site but they have become emotionally invested because it's their brand and it's their control and they can control, you know, complex event programs, you know, at different layers of the organization. So, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what the industry, you know, standard met metrics are, but uh, you know, we we definitely keep customers, especially when we get them on their own sites. What about future thinking for the company? Where where do, where are you hoping to to head next? It doesn't sound like you're in explosive growth mode, but it sounds like you're steady. What are you What are you seeing ahead? Yeah, so we're we're fun. You know, we're a bootstrap company. This is the first you know bootstrap startup I've been a part of. The last three were venture backed, and so there are trade offs to any approach. Whether you're venture backed, whether you're PE backed, or whether you're bootstrapped, the trade offs for bootstrapping a company are, uh, you know, the positives are you can really build out a long term strategic direction. And you can do things that, you know, a typical VC would say, well, why are you doing that? You got to stop doing that, uh, including probably, you know, how we price, right? Um, and so, you know, there's great benefits in that. The, the trade-off, of course, is things, you, you move slower. You have to live off your own cash flow. Nonetheless, uh, I would take, now having done both now, I would definitely take bootstrapping because, I think it's. Uh, I think we have built really. You know, uh, our focus has been building the platforms, and the platforms are. You know, we took long-term strategic. You know, focus on building those, and the platforms are solid, and they're at the. They they're able to scale from, of course, the smallest event, or uh, to the largest event, to the smallest from the smallest customer to the largest customer. So we have. Getting to your, you know, that's a long preface, Miguel, to your question, but we have a lot of surface area for a small company. We have a, a full, full-fledged e-commerce platform in four markets. We have a full-fledged events platform, same, and then we have fundraising. So for us, our, you know, our focus right now, and I, you know, I look two to three years out tops because it's all about execution. Number one is just making those those three platforms integrate better and work together better. And so, for instance, we just added a feature where on the registration confirmation page, we integrated an e-commerce, the ability to integrate an e-commerce storefront there to cross-sell and upsell promotional merchandise at the point of registration. So concept being the person, you know, who just had their wallet out and now wear merch to the actual event itself. Um, so integration is a, a real big you know, focus for us. I think the other focus for us is, uh, is more you know, global expansion. We just launched uh, you know, multi-language capabilities on the e-commerce platform, first language being Spanish. Uh, we're gonna continue do, you know, uh, launching those uh, on the events as well as fundraising. And then finally, we want to make it even easier uh, uh, on you know, all three platforms for someone to come in, set up their their site entirely on their own, walk through the configuration questions, and then have a full private label, you know, full full fledged events platform of their own. Right now, we can do that in e commerce, and then uh, we're going to build that out uh, on the events platform. And you know, one of the segments we're looking at and why we're doing that is, you know, one segment we want to get better, you know, more acquainted with and uh, and more we want to empower more is really the experiential and the event marketing agencies. Because so many of their customers, you know, come to them with an event concept or an event idea or just an event they're doing, they need executional, you know, uh, ideation, executional help. 
Many of those customers going to those agencies do not have registration platforms in mind. They do not have an event platform in mind. I would love to empower those uh, event marketing agencies to have their own under their brand and they can offer it to their customers. We could do that today. I would just love it to be even you know, self-serve. Are you then going for the SaaS model here or is this a little bit different? No, the price city would be exactly the same. Uh, we do uh, we do uh, rev share with uh, you know partners like that. Uh, so if they it's still a service fee model, but then we'll work out a rev share with them. So okay. they don't pay anything up front. They can market it, and then only when their customers you know are you know you know their customers customers I should say are buying you know registering or buying tickets. That's when they, you know, make the money. But on the events platform, just in general, do you see it going more towards a SaaS model? Because I see that you're, you know, you're very involved in the customer service. That's a big part of also your offering. Do you expect to be sort of more hands-on or do you think people are looking for something that's sort of more hands-off? I mean. Okay. Yeah. Let me, I misunderstood your question. So we are today what you would call a SaaS usage model. And what I mean by that is we're software as a service and a usage model uh, based pricing. We're not SaaS, you know, subscription as a service, right? And we'll 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 never do that. Um, we will as and this is part of kind of our our true partner pricing. We will always help people with setting up their events. Uh, in fact, last week. Uh, we had a small nonprofit, I think it was outside of Philadelphia. They had never done kind of an online event with fundraising. My customer support person uh, spent an uh, hour and 15 minutes with that, uh, with that executive director setting up everything. We love that because now we have that customer, uh, you know, again and again and again. So we never charge for customer support or customer onboarding any, or training. Uh, that's just that's just part of yeah that's part of our pricing it's all free. Are you concerned with the scalability of that? Again, sort of going back to that sort of uh, looking at the business model. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, at this point, no, and especially given the models kind of we you know look at right in, in terms of our planning models. Once we get a customer you know trained and familiar with their site. Um, you know, I'll take the example of, uh, well, our, our largest customer is Ducks Unlimited. They run 6,000 events. They have over 100, uh, you know, regional directors setting up those events with four 2,200 chapters. Once we get them trained, uh, they're on, you know, they do a great job on their own. Uh, the, the software is pretty intuitive. Doesn't mean we can't improve it. We can certainly improve it, but it's pretty intuitive. So once we kind of get that level of onboarding and training, uh, that it scales, it uh, and it scales, and it helps those organizations to really scale their events. Yeah, it's interesting because it sounds to me that it's not really you know SaaS as you say, but in that sense that you're kind of giving people the keys, they can they can go and figure stuff out, but then you're helping them enough to get them kind of confident and comfortable, and you're also building that relationship as you're doing that because then when they want to do something different, they'll kind of reach out to your team and, and kind of they'll help them figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, um, we, you know, and, and if they need, I, I would really say, and I think our customers would say this, <clears throat> you know, we provide a white glove service all the way uh, to, to their, you know, their first set of events. And, and if they want to get, uh, if they need more help after that, we're certainly there to help them. There's a lot of, uh, there's some you know, organizations that are what I would say have not entered the digital world of events. Frankly, we love that because it's a great opportunity for us. There's no question there's more upfront customer support uh, involved with that. But once we get them there, uh, they, they, stay, they stay with us because it, frankly, no other company will do that especially at the level of pricing that we offer. 
Yeah, that's small margins, but it sounds like you're making it work. So, so congrats on that. Yeah, thank you. It's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. So I want to zoom out a little bit now and talk about kind of bigger picture things. Um, focusing on the events industry, our audience is, is mainly on the planning side of the events industry. What do you think the biggest challenges are currently in the events industry? Yeah, I, as I, I kind of look towards, especially given the time of year, Miguel, I'm looking towards 2024. And what, what I'm observing are <clears throat> a couple of things. One is, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious that the economy is going to slow down. Uh, you know, CFOs are talking about it. And when a CFO is talking about it, they're going to go to the other, you know, CXOs including the CMO and say, okay, what's your budget? And of course, the component of the budget are events and where can you either stay flat or where can you cut? Or, you know, if you want an increase, you better justify it. So I think we're going to be in an environment of a slowing economy. At the same time, there's <clears throat> and, it's not or, and people realize that, you know, in-person events matter. But I think that's going to be important. I think, you know, all the budget line items of any particular event are going to have more scrutiny. Uh, people are going to find ways to save money because they want to drive a, a higher event ROI. And that comes down to the tech, you know, and tech event platforms they're using. Uh, I'm, you know, I even at IMEX America, you know, I started sensing that people wanted value. And Tim O'Reilly, you know, Silicon Valley guru, et cetera, he, he has this great guiding principle that I've used in all the startups I've been part of is you have to create more value than you capture. And I say that to my team all the time is that we really need to create more value than we capture. And if we do that, we have long-term customers. But it, so a slowing economy is the number one. And so... I think the other uh, the other one that's uh, really important that is in numerous conversations right now is really sustainability, and you know uh, making people feel good that they're in you know that they're at an in person event, but that in person event and that live event has done you know nearly everything possible to make it sustainable. Uh, so you know the no guilt climate friendly event. Right. And so <clears throat> one of the ways that I think you'll uh, you'll see this kind of uh, come to fruition in 2024 is that, you know, any event has a number of different vendors. And of course, to help you execute that event, I think in those vendor contracts, you're going to see more and more event organizers uh, have uh, sustainability uh, sections. And, you know, we're, we've, you know, We've been on this, uh, you know, train for a long time. So since 2007, we have donated 42% of our net profits to climate and conservation. Number two is every shipment of uh, products from us is entirely carbon neutral. We pay for that. Number three is we take a percentage of our revenue, top line revenue, and uh, we uh, donate it to Stripe's carbon removal program, which literally is removing carbon. Number four is we also make sure all of our web hosting is entirely powered by renewable energy. And then lastly, our production facility is 100% powered by wind energy. So those are, you know, and I feel, you know, I don't mean to boast about that, but I'm really proud of what we're doing there because there, there is no event platform that has done more around sustainability, climate, and conservation than us. That is a bold claim. I'm going to test others to see if, if they can match. But but I, I'd say yes. I'd say you you're doing it, everything I know from a technology <laughs> perspective. So I think that's uh... well, it's real money. You know that we we've literally donated real money. So I'm happy to, you know, happy to go head to head. <laughs> what about your vision for the future of, of the, the industry and kind of if, how events are run? Do you see events being very different, let's say, in, in five or, or 10 years time than, than how they are kind of today? 
you know, even though I'm a tech person and I love tech and I could, you know, expound on AI, I could expound on AR, VR, you know, all of that, all of those will play a part. But fundamentally, you know, we're, we're, we're a tribal species and it's going to be those moments of magic and interaction of looking at another human being or in a group of human beings and conversing and talking and collaborating or being in a moment where you're learning, right? And light bulbs are going off and that kind of energy. And, you know, as you know, we all have mirror neurons in our frontal cortex. I'm getting really nerdy now, as my kids like to say. Those mirror neurons are really important because that's, you know, kind of who we are as a social species. And uh, technology can perhaps augment that, perhaps enhance that. But I really think uh, events at their core will be what events are today. Well, thanks. I think that's uh, reassuring for a lot of uh, for a lot of people in the industry. And I, I think I, I tend to agree with your with your vision. What about attracting the younger generations? Because that's something we've been covering a lot. And, um, you know, for some younger generations, it doesn't feel as as an exciting as an industry as it maybe once did. Um, do you have any thoughts for kind of people entering the industry, how they should, how we should attract them and how they should think about the industry to be successful? Yeah, I think one thing if I was trying to attract people to the industry, um, I think this concept of, there's no question that we've crossed the Rubicon on remote work. And, you know, people are going to have either hybrid, you know, uh, workplaces or they're going to have remote workplaces. And I think for the younger generation, as I've, you know, counseled, you know, my, my son, who's now entered the workforce, it is really important that they, you know, be with their co fellow coworkers. It's really important to go out and you know, go to events, even though they quote unquote have the option of working at home. So what I would you know do is really leverage the excitement of travel and the excitement of being with people, give them you know an organizational framework to really navigate an event well, to you know, not only navigate but also have fun, bring other team members to it, and I think that becomes a new you know frankly you know employee benefit. Uh, of travel, of going to at least you know certain amount of conferences per year, and getting them involved, and and I'm saying this you know getting them into the events industry can also be part of that, but I would really key off on the remote work and and, and helping people understand, yeah, you know, it's really fun to be together, and it's really fun to execute physical events right with real people. And um, and I think th that's what I do. The second thing, you know, this is more general career advice is for, for people entering the industry. I really think it's important that you become very good at one function when you first start out. Um, and then uh, once you kind of nail that, you know, that function or that that particular role and, you know, and, and responsibilities, do another one, so you're pretty, you got two under your bag, but then that enables you this pretty solid foundation to really start stretching out and becoming a, a generalist. And then, uh, and then you know, you, it gives you a lot of different optionality in your career. I like it. Definitely a, a little bit of a career path, career plan there for, for people. So uh, thanks for sharing that. So Lance, I wanna wrap up by asking you to suggest someone who should be on the podcast. It's always fun to uh, connect with, with different people and I enjoyed our conversation so much, but I uh, wanna, wanna connect the dots and maybe if you suggest someone that you think would be interesting and, and what would you ask them if they were on the podcast? Prior to IMX uh, America, uh, in fact, a week prior, I didn't plan this by the way, uh, my wife and I and friends went to uh, the Sphere and saw YouTube. And uh, the, the sphere, of course, as we all recognize, is, I mean, number one, is one of the most viral topics, you know, in the world right now. <laughs> number two is it's a venue. It's an event experience. 
And so it's uh, it's incredibly exciting. And, it, and, you know, when I was in there and experiencing it, I was like, wow, humankind can really pull off amazing things. Um, but what I would do and the guest I would ask to be on your show would be uh, Jim Dolan, of course, CEO of The Sphere, as well as m many other things. And, yeah, I would have him project forward 20 years and give us a vision, right, of the sphere that's still, you know, relevant. It's not tired. It's even more interesting. Uh, and and if, by doing that, it would be interesting to get his thoughts on, you know, where, you know, outland, what I would call outlandish in a good way, outlandish venues like that can go. I think it would be fun to have him on the show and, and ask him those questions. I, I'm very curious about this. I've not experienced it personally, but I was in Vegas for IMAX America and saw it from the distance. And uh, and it definitely seemed uh, nice. And it's always interesting to see that you were very impressed by it, being a, a kind of an invent technology expert. So, uh, so well done. Lance, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for listening. And I hope you join us again for future episodes of the Skiff Meetings podcast. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, y'all. I really enjoyed it.